I'm not pulling out of the driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for another drive to work, coronavirus edition. Okay, so as you know, I've been using my time at home to do interviews, which are hard to do in the car. Uh, and so today I got Glenn Jones, and he and I are going to talk about Unstable. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Mark. How's it going? So nowadays, you, you do a lot of game design, but back in the day, which we're going to talk about today, you were an editor, correct? Yeah, that was how I got my start at Wizards. Um, so a lot of the talk today, and, and uh, I had another um, podcast with uh, Matt Tabak, so you're, you're my second editor, um, but one of the things I've been trying to do with these interviews is just show different facets of magic design, because um, there are a lot of moving pieces that I don't think the audience quite realizes uh, until you start interviewing all the different people that do all the different jobs. Yeah, I agree. Uh, certainly, as a former editor, uh, I know that there are just skills and knowledge that I bring to the the role that not everyone necessarily has. And that's true of everyone who came from a different background, which we have a super diverse set of uh, professional backgrounds among our designers. Okay, so let's dive in. So Unstable is a really weird thing to edit. So what? let's just jump into like what, what, what was the biggest challenge for you as the editor of Unstable? Well, one of the interesting things about it was it was, if I recall correctly, the second set that I was the lead editor of. It went, went Conspiracy 2 and then Unstable, which are themselves both like different sets from conventional magic as well. So I was kind of like learning the learning on the job, but also, you know, learning with some instruction manuals that didn't quite match up with what we might be doing. <laughs> um, so for me, it was a lot of, you know, how much are we supposed to kind of like hand wave through and just be like, yeah, that's how it works. Or people will get this. And how much of it do we need to try and find like clean magic language that we can lean on uh, to co communicate the rules more cleanly? Uh, which I think we wound up going a little harsh, harder into like, this is a magic card. It reads mechanically and functionally like a magic card than the previous unsets had done with Unstable. Uh, and I think part of that maybe was just a symptom of my trying to be like more precise as a newer editor as well. And also a lot of time. I mean, the, the other big thing is 13 years had passed since we had had an unset before and just how we made magic sets had radically changed. Mm -hmm. For sure. And one of the things I also brought to this experience was I played a lot with those unsets. Uh, like the first one unglued I played with when I was in like sixth grade. I remember buying those packs and playing them at school and then. Uh, unhinged when I was in college, I'd play with my roommates at the kitchen table. So I had a lot of like experience drawing on like, what were the things that confused me or what were the things that, you know, were clear enough. Uh, and that, that guided some of my decision-making as well. So why don't we start talking about the, the main mechanics? Uh, so let's start with contraptions. So a uh, contraption is obviously uh, assemble. You had to assemble the contraptions, then contraptions were their own deck. And then you, you, you built this contraption that sort of went off and every turn different things happen. Um, what were the what were the biggest challenges for you with contraptions? Well, we had to do first off with it, and I'm sure you, you probably you and Ben at least certainly would remember this well. Was uh, figure out exactly what we wanted them to do and what we didn't want them to do, um, which is pretty common for an editor when something's like really tricky. Is you just ask for like, what's the list? You know, what what does it have to do? What does it have to not do? And then try and work backwards to find a, a solution that fits. And in the case of contraptions, um, I think I even think this was from Vision was the idea of using the card back uh, to communicate this. I think that that was something you, yeah. you had originally. Yeah, that that was from pretty early on. Yeah. So from once we had that kind of like in line, I, I actually worked a lot with Liz Leo, uh, who was at Wizards as a graphic designer uh, back then and is now back doing it as a producer on a different team, and. We really wanted to figure out what kind, how much information could we fit on the back? How could we organize it so that it communicates the actual mechanisms of contraptions? Um, and also, like, you know, would it, how could we match it to, like, what contraptions were? Which I'm pretty happy with the final result. Um, I, th I think it's just a really cool and innovative kind of take. It even has Magic the Gathering on the back of a Magic card, which was uh, something we weren't 100% sure we'd be able to do the whole time. So yeah. that was the biggest challenge was just working with uh with Liz and figuring out how can templating and creative kind of align together to create this frame that has a ton of in-game functionality but also needs to look good and and be enjoyable and resonant for the set. Once we got the the back of the card kind of put together, 
contraptions themselves weren't really that tricky. Like the rules are relatively straightforward. Uh, we had to, you know, like make some relatively short text for the back of the card so that it would fit. But the actual functionality is like pretty similar, pretty simple. Uh, you know, you flip it over, you trigger it. Lots of people are familiar with triggering magic cards, so that part wasn't very hard. Right. I think I think the hard part for contraptions that for us to communicate well, two things. One is it was an ext- another deck, and just the idea of what does that mean? What does another deck mean? Um, and the second thing is the that there were three what we call them sprockets. I think um, you know that the idea that. Mm-hmm you would rotate between these three options of things happening and trying to get people to understand that, like, you know, you were building this thing that not everything happened every turn was something that was a a little confusing. Um, Once people got it, they seemed to get it. Yeah, it was definitely, like, the fact that you have a separate deck was something that uh, was tricky to communicate. Like, it takes a lot of words uh, to say that kind of thing. So we wound up being, you know, kind kind of careful about it. We put it in the reminder text of the cards in the set, um, so that we didn't have to put it on the back of the deck itself, with the logic being, you know, if you if you have to have a contraption to assemble it, something has to say that there's a separate deck already on the battlefield, so we don't need to clarify that on the contraption cards themselves, because you would never be looking at them unless you already had the reminder text in front of you, essentially. Um, so we're, we're pretty happy with that solve, and we did have to do some, like, kind of odd cut corners and stuff, like the reminder text of Sprocket 1 follows Sprocket 3, on the back of the card was something that we arrived at when we just couldn't figure out a graphic design solution that was clear enough. Um, we tried, you know, like little looping arrows and stuff like that uh, among the gears. But in the end, we were just like, let's just make sure that people don't mess this up and, and just know exactly how it goes. And there was one other thing that um, I, I think threw a wrinkle into things. Um, so the entire contraption mechanic came about because of Steam Flogger Boss, a card from a future mm-hmm. shifted card from Future Sight. And we were trying very hard to make everything that Steam Flogger Boss was true. So, for example, yeah. I knew that, like, the creatures had to assemble rather than you, the player, assemble. Yep. Um, and that, I think if we had, like, if we're just making the mechanic anew, probably you would have assembled. But because, like, the way Steam Flogger Boss was templated, the creatures had to assemble. So, like, we, I know we spent some time making sure that was true. Yeah, we mostly just templated all the creatures to be like it assembles instead of assemble, which is a relatively small uh, give. Obviously, like if a spell were to assemble, it, it just set, says, you know, like assembles or could normally. I do think Steam Flogger Boss is actually kind of an interesting kind of case study in that throw forward because it, you know, obviously we did wind up being constrained a little bit by the rigor you control element, as you said, but also as a throw forward, like, you know, it's a card that doesn't need reminder text on it since it can't do the thing itself anyway um and that was i think kind of a a clever little gimmick that actually gave us obviously a ton of leeway to like make the mechanic whatever we want since i I think you you know you didn't really know exactly what it was when we steam floggered in the first place (laughs) well not only that when we made it we had no intention of doing it uh the problem was aaron aaron used to write a weekly article and aaron like just said in his article, we have no intention of ever doing this, which you should never say to the magic playing public. <laughs> Cause then it's like, Oh, now we need you to do this. Um, yeah. And we did look at places in non unsets to try to do contraptions, but the, what we found was there was no way to sort of, to like be, fulfill the promise of it in a way that black border worked really cleanly with. And so silver border kind of just let us do things that we would be hard to do in a normal set. Like, have another deck, for example. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. Although we've obviously, like, you know, in recent time come a lot closer to that than maybe we used to be. Like, the dungeon is not super distant from having a separate deck, in a sense. Uh, And actually, you know, when we were in AFR, we did play versions of the dungeon that did involve multiple cards, uh, which was a little closer to contraptions, too. Right. Well, I mean, I I do think the unsets are kind of future testing, like... Anything mm-hmm. you see in an unset one day, maybe we can do it, you know. Um, there are a lot of things that at the time we... Like, it's funny to go back and look at Unglued and Unhinged. There are cards there that, like, why are these even in... You know, like, couldn't these just be done? And, like, nowadays they could be done. But at the yeah. time, you know... At the time, you know, mentioning Teammate, we could never do that on, you know, a black-bordered card. Yeah, I mean, when I was leading Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Commander, obviously we added die rolling with Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. And one of the first things I did... Uh, on that team was go back to unhinged and un- uh, un- uh, unglued and unstable. unstable. Yeah. And 
like just review the die rolling cards and see like what did we do that seems like it transfers what what didn't transfer etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so the other mechanic which actually i think was a little more problematic was uh augment host and augment so let's talk oh, about that the, one yeah let's talk about the challenges of host and augment yeah. Oh, host and augment. That one was definitely a bear in a way that contraptions weren't, because um, it was just a pretty dramatic shift, both in like what we expect a magic card to do, and also just our process. Like a uh, a contraption is kind of simple in a way. Like the front side is just a magic card, the back side is like a new back, but you can just print text. Not not too tricky. But augment host is in this space where it's like it definitely is supposed to be a magic card. Like it should look very much like one but we need to offset text in some really peculiar ways, which our process is not generally uh, designed to do in the first place. So there was a lot of work with typesetting, which is a different team, to figure out what were the you know, actual possibilities here. Like how long could an ability be? Like where could we put it? How long, how, how wide can things be? Like you know, there's gotta be some overlap between the cards. What's the correct amount of overlap? What can we do that gets repeated over and over? Which wound up kind of being defined by the card type, since the length of, like, you know, creature M dash is basically consistent on every card. But, of course, that's not 100% true, uh, since we also had the the hosts that are artifacts. And we had to figure out a solve for, like, okay, how does a host artifact creature and a host creature work? Uh, because they have different size type lines, which we wound up kind of leaning in for all of these to the idea that these are this like Dr. Moreau type slap dashed together creature vibe. Like let's lean into that with the typesetting and frame design. Like it's going to look a little weird and maybe a little awkward and let's pretend that that's how it's supposed to look. Right. Like we've got the graph paper nailed onto the card. Like that's, that doesn't, that's just, you know, a hokey kind of, yeah, this is, you know, somebody put this together right now. Um, we've got the artifact kind of broken off of the type bar and slapped into the rules text box so that it's always visible whenever you're host or augmented. Um, so those were kind of the tricky things that we worked, uh, again, with typesetting and, and Liz Leo to figure out, like, how, how do we make sure that all of the information people need to know is always communicated? And then the art directors had a whole different uh, thing that they had to work through, which was that large metal bar representing where the creatures are merged together, like, how do you write art descriptions and get art that's going to make sure all of these creatures are combining in ways that are like visually compelling. And I don't want to say not ridiculous because obviously they're all ridiculous. Um, but we want it to kind of like make sense. Like when you merge two together, even though it's crazy, you're like, okay, yeah, now I have this thing. It looks like what it is. Yeah. The part, so Dawn, uh, Dawn Mirren was our art director and she is the one that came up with the bar. Cause what happened was, mm -hmm. um, when we originally made the card, we we drew a little sketch of it. It was like a like a merfolk ninja or something. Like the front was a merfolk, back was a ninja. I think, or oh, it was a shark ninja. The front was a shark, back was a ninja. Um, <laughs> and I sort of showed that to Dawn, and she's like, "Well, that only works because you drew it that way." You like, I every every left side and every right side have to go together. Um, yeah. And then she came back and said, okay, well, what if we do this little bar and then, you know, the far right side of every card has the bar and the far left side of every augment has a bar and then you just put the bars together and, like, that was her solve and it worked really well. Yeah, and it kind of, it's philosophically owes something to, like, that tradition in stage magic too, right? Where, like, you just have two incredible things and then, like, a small curtain or something and there's, there's something in there. You don't know what it is, but that's where everything's happening and that's the bar. The bar is where the, ma the magic happens here. Yeah, the other interesting thing about trying to make host and augment work was um, the combinatorics of it were very complicated in that, um, like, any left side had to go with any right side. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the big breakthrough we had in design was the idea that we do inputs and outputs, so that the left side is always an input and the right side is always an output, so any input could go with any output. Yeah, I think that was a really charming execution that also kept the story of each side intact because it's not too difficult to do uh, outputs that, you know, feel like a dog or a cat or whatever uh, in the context of the set. And that, that helps the flavor a lot. Uh, we were also coming kind of recent, relatively recently at the time off of uh, Theros when we were in the design period here. It was like, I don't know, two, two years after or something when we were working on the set. I mean, I know it was in development for like a long time, so yeah. <laughs> it kind of predated Theros in the sets as well. Uh, but I know when I was working with, with Ben Hayes in development, there was a lot of talk about 
you know, like how do we want to make these work in, in kind of a way that Bestow had had similar issues where it's like, you know, we want to make sure that if you're trying to augment onto something like it's not super easy for your opponent to just two for one you constantly or disrupt you in these weird ways. Uh, we wanted to make sure you were getting to do the thing um, since it's a pretty fun thing and, and it's a mainstay of the set. So we wanted to encourage it. Yeah, and there are a lot of like as fan concerns. Like if you look at the set, there's a lot more hosts at low rarities and augments at higher rarities. Because yep. if you get a host by itself, it's just a creature with an enter the battlefield effect. But if you get an augment by yourself, it's unplayable. And so we yep. did a lot. We had to support it and, and make sure that like you're going to get a host way more than you're going to get an augment. Um, but it, yeah, it definitely it turned out really well. And like I said, it's 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 one of the mechanics that people always ask me to sort of put in a normal magic set, and I'm like. The prop, the biggest problem is that the it requires something like the art thing, which is very weird and silly, and works works in, a, in an unset. But I, yeah. I don't know if we get away with that in in a normal set in quite the same way. I mean, with a, we came pretty close. Obviously, it was pretty different with mutate in Ikoria. Um, it's de definitely very different. But like, I, I see a lot. I see a decent amount of post and augment in uh, the aspirations of mutate, at least. Yeah, yeah, d definitely, and. The, the other interesting thing about uh, Host and Augment is the fact, I mean, we had Mel, Mel technology, so that the rules, I think the, Mel, Mel predated this. Uh, the idea that you have two cards that represent one thing, I mean, Unglued obviously had BFM, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, just having a lot of rule support for like, what does it mean when, you know, two things are one thing? But we had, Mel had existed, I think, before this, so like we had to hammer out a lot of that, and plus BFM existed long ago, so. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about... Um, a few other uh, smaller mechanics in the set. Um, so outside assistance was something where we involved other people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about templating and writing cards where you're involving people <laughs> not playing the game. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a, an oddly significant uh, concern that we make sure to template the cards so that participation wasn't uh, necessarily capable of becoming involuntary or uh, skewing violence. I think my, my favorite one of these is the, uh, I think it's Gimme Five, where you get one you get one life for each person who high-fives you in the next 30 seconds. So that's really specifically templated. So you have to hold your hand up and be like, come on, everybody, you know, like, give it, give it to me, uh, as opposed to, like, each person you high-five, where you might be inclined to try and, like, run around the room slapping people on their hands, uh, which is not the desired intent. So we, we reviewed kind of carefully the outside assistance cards to make sure that, you know, people could get involved if they wanted to and, and not if they didn't. Um, there was a pretty enjoyable moment when we were doing some playtesting, I remember, with Kind Slaver, where Tim Ayton, who was, was another editor, was uh, requested to come and play out a turn for somebody. For Ben. <laughs> uh, yeah, for Ben, yeah. And uh, just savagely alpha attack Ben's creatures into a, a suicidal swing and told Ben to never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, don't uh, ask Tim to do this. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Tim did have to be asked and did consent. So that was uh, in the in keeping with the spirit of what we were trying to do. <laughs> so, okay, so here's a, a thing. Um, one of the things that's fun is, as an editor, you get to have a lot of sort of influence in things. And, and I don't think the average person even realizes how much influence an editor actually has on it. So they have a huge amount of influence. So... I just want to talk about some cards, really, where you were able to put, you know, a little bit of Glenn on the card. Um, sure. So let's start with uh, one of my favorite, uh, Extremely Slow Zombie. This was this was a very clever little editing touch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kelly Diggs and I worked together a lot on this set. Kelly was the creative lead. Um, and so the reminder, the, normally, like, you know, there's a pretty simple process of, you know, the creative sends creative text to the editor. They review it make some markups, debate some stuff, and it, and it kind of just goes back and forth until we're done. Um, but with Unstable, there was a much more, uh, like, in concert approach of, like, you know, what can we, what can we do with each thing? Like, what can be the, it was almost like we were top-lining flavor text in a way. Like, with art, you know, we top-line, this is the kind of what the card should be. Like, you know, Novelemental is supposed to be, like, a flying book. Like, that's the gag. But also, like, how does the reminder text reflect the story of Novelemental, uh, with which we leaned into the variable uh, card text as opposed to variable card art which is another whole other thing <laughs> um and novellamental is actually cool because i got to write i wrote the novella for novellamental uh i think because if i recall correctly we had like you know flavor text writers who were submitting various things and i think nobody had submitted for novellamental um 
And so I told Kelly that I would take a swing at it. And then we wound up pretty, pretty much just printing that. Uh, and then extremely slow zombie returning to that, uh, the brains gag across all four cards. Like I, I think that was Kelly's idea was the, the slow speech indicating like it's, it talks so slow. It barely moves from piece to piece with like, it just takes, you know, a year for it to reach up towards you. Um, but I do have the kind of amusing regret. Every editor has regrets that nobody else probably even knows or thinks about <laughs> because they know uh, something that nobody else does in general cases. And for me, one of my like more nuanced editorial regrets in Magic is that we didn't start with Winter. So the Winter Zombie could be brrrr, uh, which is just like that slight miss on We got to like 99% of the best joke. <laughs> So uh, you also worked, um, I know, so Amateur Auteur. One of the things we did in the set is we did a bunch of alternate um, versions of cards. Real quickly, the behind the scenes of that is when we were first, uh, when we were first trying to get the set done, one of the things we uh, had negotiated was because Unsets sort of paved new ground, uh, there's some new digital printing. And so they, we designed the set originally to play into some new digital printing. Uh, and so we had a lot of variants based on what we could do with digital printing. And then by the time it got time to make the set, digital printing hadn't yet got there. And so we sort of had a jettison a bunch of our ideas for that. And so that ended up being some of these alternate variants of things. Like some have different rule text, some have different art. Um, amateur author had different art, obviously. And mm -hmm. so, so Kelly came up with this very clever thing where... Um, it was a kid performing in a play, and then each play was from a different famous plane of magic. I think it was like Ravnica and Theros and Innistrad and Zendikar, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then there's a little poem that was written for each one, like a song, like from the from the play that's being performed. Yeah, I know that Kelly... I don't know for sure that Kelly wrote the plays. I, I think he did, but it's possible that those some of those came from the flavor text writers as well. I'm not 100% sure there. I know I didn't write the poems uh, that, that were used in the flavor text. Um, but I did uh, work with Kelly on them because I actually uh, went to school for English and history. That, that was Those were my majors, and specifically like creative writing in English. So I actually had taken some poetry classes. Uh, I am, I wouldn't consider myself a poet, but like I'm academically like aware of kind of how they're supposed to work and the general flow and stuff like that. So it was amusing to me that, you know, I would get for the first time in my life, uh, I was using my, a part of my English degree, which is already kind of hard <laughs> to use in general. Uh, and this time, and it was the poetry meter, uh, to work out like how could these, uh, these flavor texts, feel like they were from a musical and also feel different from each other. Cause right. It's important that they're not the same musical. Like the whole gag is that it's four different plays uh, with different names. So there are little variations in their meter or the tone, you know, like some of them are really silly and goofy. And then some other ones maybe seem a little bit more dramatic at times, but all musicals have like a little bit of a lighthearted element to them in, in general. So we made sure to incorporate that. So another interesting thing, I think, uh, uh, Unsets have some tools that the editors don't really have access to normally. Um, and one of the interesting tools, we talked a little bit about the frame, but the art, that when we make an uncard, we sort of have the, the art can be a component of the card in a way that in normal sort of black border magic, we don't necessarily get. I mean, it clearly shows what's going on, but it's a usable piece of property at times. And I know mm -hmm. that one, one of the cards I know you were trying to fix was... Uh, Baron von Count, and you you had a clever solution using the art. So I, I'm here. I'm interested to hear how that came about. Yeah, Baron von Count was tricky. Uh, we wanted to do kind of a countdown shtick, uh, which we've since done a little bit in some other cards, like sagas are actually you know kind of like a countdowny type thing. Um, but for the specifics of Baron von Count, we didn't really have anything like that in the tank or any any ideas. But one of the things Kelly had recognized was as one of the things we were allowing ourselves to kind of do in the set was uh, to put, you know, language and characters in some of the art where we might normally not have uh, since we weren't localizing the set in a bunch of languages. Uh, and so that gave me the idea for Baron Von Count of to actually use the art as a gameplay aid where we could create these like larger numbers um, somewhere in the art and people could slide like a small bead or uh, whatever, across the card to kind of get the vibe of, of counting down. Uh, and 
Kelly and Don were game to to give it a go. And I was really happy with how it came out. I think it's like I don't even think people honestly like use it that much because dice are so available. Um, but it was a novel exploration and I think adds to kind of the silver border charm of the Baron himself. Um, and then we also get to reference it later on the, the, the clock card as well. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think I, from, from the data I've seen, Baron is one of the more popular unstable, uh, commanders. Yes. M- yeah, might be, I, might be the most popular well. unstable commander. He's, he's up there. They're all, they're all pretty cool though. I, I've seen a decent number of them at, at various commander tables. Um, so the uh, another interesting thing that happened in the set was um, two cards in the set reference IPs outside of Magic, uh, and this was at the time we did it, no one had done it yet. I, I think the Hasbro cards, came, Hascon cards, came out before us, um, but we actually did it before before uh, anybody else. Just they didn't come out necessarily first. So I want to talk mm-hmm. a little bit about uh, the Sword of Dungeon Dragons and go to jail. Yeah, I know that the Sword of Dungeons and Dragons was pretty easy uh, to get done, and we were pretty stoked to be able to include it in the Hascon thing, too. It was mostly just, you know, we had a meeting with some D&D art directors and magic art directors, I think think just Don and Kelly and, and myself and maybe a few other people about, like, you know, what should this look like? What are the gags that we can do that, like, tie it in, like... The gold dragon was a particularly delightful one um, to us. Was you know we didn't want to say uh, like red and white or whatever we were thinking about doing at the time, but like just a gold dragon. Like what? That, that's a thing in D anD. d It's not really a thing in magic, but um, there's nothing saying we couldn't do that. Uh, so we decided to take that that angle with it, and I really enjoyed also having the art for the token be like it's you know tearing right out of the page of a Dungeons and Dragons book. I thought that was really cool. The, the other note that changed the card when we talked to them was uh, we originally had you roll three six-sided dice, and they changed it to mm-hmm. a 20... They asked us to change it to a 20-sided die. Yeah, yeah. We were happy about that and happy about getting to, say, a, a D20 as well. Yeah. Um, so that card, you know, we could just go next kind of next door almost and ask them, hey, can we do this? But go to jail was like a whole different thing because that's, you know, like a Hasbro property, so we want to... Yeah, we have to talk to a lot of different teams and people that we don't necessarily communicate as often with uh, about, you know, like, Hey, what would you like this to do? What would you not like it to do? Uh, What can we call it? Um, And in the end, I think, you know, we got to a pretty happy spot where the card is like immediately recognizable as uh, a backwards shot at Monopoly. If you're familiar with uh, Monopoly at all, even the pose of the ogre is like reminiscent of the board, the spot on the game board. Uh, and then mechanically the doubles are like spot on. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with those. And, and they are really kind of the first universes beyond cards uh, in a sense, which is pretty cool. Again, another way that Silver Border uh, takes a step ahead of Black Border. Yeah, one of the things that I think is real important is how much like kind of not having the rules that everybody else has lets us try things. And then down the road, people go, oh, you know, it, it paves ground for things, which I, I think is pretty cool. Yeah. So I, I I can see my desk. So we're we're, we're I'm almost to work here. Um, <laughs> any final thoughts? Any final unstable thoughts? Things we didn't I didn't bring up? Uh, no, I mean it was a super cool set to work on. Uh, like I said, you know it was pretty early in my career at Wizards, and I considered it like a huge opportunity uh, and a, and a privilege because it was just such an unusual thing. Um, and it's kind of fa- fascinating how much of looking back on it, like little bits and pieces of it have shown up in other sets, like, you know, as we talked about, like mutate and, uh, various things like that. So yeah, uh, super glad that we got to work together on it. I think this was like the first time that we really worked together on anything actually, uh, I think, was yes, I think unstable. It was. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause like the, the other big thing about sort of the designer editor, uh, relationship is there's a lot of give and take, like the editor very much is trying to figure out how to execute, but they, you know, the intent is, is important. So there's a lot of discussions of, okay, what exactly do you want this card to do? Yep. Th- th- that happens all the time. Uh, you know, the editor says, what, what are you trying to do with this card? And then, you know, and you walk through and then a lot of times the editor will come up with like clever executions in ways you hadn't thought about and like, oh, I, li- I like that. That wasn't how I intended it, but yes, that, that's a cool way we can execute on it. Um, and on cards more so than normal because... Uh, whenever you're trying to do something we've never done before, you know, like, there's no template. There's, there's no mm-hmm. previous card to look at. And so uncards more so than the average, I think, um, 
the, the designing editing relationship is, is even more important just because you're paving a lot more new ground. Yeah. And I, and I also think there's a kind of the ratio of like importance of destination to importance of execution is kind of different. Like the destination is much more important in silver border world. Whereas yeah, in black border world, we have to pay a lot more attention to the specifics of the execution to make sure it matches everything around it. Yeah. And that's one, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm obviously a big fan of onsets, but, uh, <laughs> it, it's one of the things that's really really fun for me is that the unsets will lean a little more into what's the fun version of this version what's the technically cleanest clearest version of it that I, I think black border really has to kind of follow um and it's nice sometimes to go you know what people will want to do this let's lean in that direction and that's kind of fun to do yeah i agree well anyway uh i'm now at my desk so uh we all know what that means means it's the end of my drive to work. So instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. But I want to thank you, Glenn, for being with us. Yeah, happy to do it. And as always, it's, it's always fun to talk unsets. So thank you very much for joining us. Anytime. Okay, guys. That, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, guys, that's it for this week. And I will see you all next week. Bye-bye.